Welcome to the second hour of our special presentation of Mr. Faith and Physics Presents, Alan Watts in The World is Play. In the first hour, Mr. Watts discusses the secret of the opposites, which is that they are interdependent and as such constitute a single entity, even though we consider them to be quite separate and as opposed as possible. Currently, he is discussing the second precept of his theory, which has to do with relativity, directing our attention to the relationships between all things, which again indicates an inseparable interdependence, including what appears to be unique and individual human beings. Continuing now with the second hour discussing relativity, here is Alan Watts giving his lecture on the world as play. It is the touch that evokes the hardness in the tape. When it is not touched, it's not soft, it's not hard. It has no quality at all. Nothing which is not in relation to us has any existence. Or, I will add, in relation to some other kind of responsive creature. Just in the same way that when light energy goes out of the sun into space, the energy will only be manifested as light if there is some body outside the sun to reflect the light. Otherwise, the light does not in any way illumine the darkness of space. You must bring something into it to manifest the light in space. So a Zen poem says, The tree manifests the bodily power of the wind. The water manifests the spiritual nature of the moon. Because, you see, if the wind is blowing, that is to say, an energy is moving along and there is nothing to stand in its way, the energy is not there. The energy in the situation is evoked only by something standing in its way. Then it's manifest. The water manifests the spiritual power of the moon. Why? Because in the breaking waves, the moon can be shattered into thousands of fragments. And yet it always remains one. That's its spiritual power. You wouldn't see that miracle of the moon if it weren't for the waves. And they divide it up like that. All right, you can say, it's a distortion. The moon is, the waves are not reflecting it correctly. But that's only trying to say that things reflected in a smooth and still surface are reflected more really than things reflected in a vibrating surface. Okay, if you want to construe it that way, it's your, your privilege. But you can have any kind of reflector you want. So in the same way, it is with you. What you see, therefore, depends on the way your senses are constructed. You have certain kinds of sense organs, and these sense organs evoke the kind of universe appropriate to it's not necessarily the way things are. Because there is no way that things are apart from their impact or better relationship with some kind of perceiver or perceiving organism. Because things are only in relation. When there is nothing to which they can relate, nothing is happening. And the the so-called existence which we perceive, and that to which it is related, come into being together. Now, is that to say that uh, before any living organisms existed, there wasn't any universe? Is that to say that all our knowledge of the prehistoric and geological past of the world and the cosmos before life came to it is nothing but an extrapolation, that is to say, uh, all we are saying is that this is what would have been happening if there had been people around to see it. But since there weren't, since there was no living organism around to witness this, nothing was going on. Now, it's possible to make a very good case for that point of view. But I would like to be a little more modest and not make it quite that uh, radical. And I would say rather this, there would never have been a universe before living beings existed unless there was going to be a creature called man. 
man living in a future, say, implies in the past a certain state of affairs. In other words, this planet had to come into being with an adequate amount of uh, temperature, oxygen, gases, everything else, food supplies, for the organism called man to exist. So let me say then, the existence of man implies a certain kind of environment, uh, meteorological, geological, and astronomical. But the other side of this proposition is that such an environment implies man. Now, where you get two sides of the situation where they imply each other mutually, you have, in fact, a truly relational and unitary system. Well, then, therefore, the answer to this problem is that prior to the existence of any form of life, the universe at that time is dependent upon the fact that those forms of life are going to emerge. Now, this is a thing that uh, is very difficult for us to understand. Because we think of reality proceeding forward into the future, but dependent only upon the past. It's very difficult for us to see that events that we call past are dependent upon events in the future. That a lot of things would never start it unless certain results were going to happen. Again, this is another of those ideas which is an affront to common sense. But uh, there are a number of ways of showing it's quite a sensible idea. Uh, unless you were, if you know, you're flying an aeroplane, you leave London, you arrive in New York, you wouldn't have started out from London unless you had known in advance there was a place called New York where you could land. So, in a very similar way, the energy system of the universe does not start out with certain, say, very primitive and needed creatures until it knows that it can arrive. I don't know where, where it's going on beyond man, but at least it's got to get as far as man. Because if it's not going to be able to do that, it won't even start. Now, you can put this in other terms. An electric current. Uh, electricity isn't like water. When you turn on the faucet, the water goes right down the hose and waits at the nozzle. So as soon as you turn on the nozzle, there's the water. An electric current is not. When you've got two wires, I mean two terminals, positive and negative, you've got the positive one hitched up, and here's your wire, and you leave the end of that wire just an inch away from the negative terminal. There is no electric, electric current moving. It hasn't flowed down the wire from the positive terminal so that it waits to be ready to jump. The trouble with is that, uh, is that electricity moves so fast we don't see these things. And if you can only see it if you do it on a colossal scale. Let's supposing that we had an electric wire that was, uh, oh, 300 million miles in length. Now we connect it at the positive end. Nothing is wrong. Connect it at the negative end. So that too can have the possibility. See, that's the other terminal. Then immediately the circuit starts. But the circuit of electric current does not start until there is a place for it to rock to arrive. See, that's the point. So, in exactly the same way, it may, see, it makes no difference whether the wire be something that uh, is 180,000 miles and is traversed in one second, or whether it's 60 billion miles that will take a somewhat longer time. In either case, the current will not start until the receptor terminal, the minus terminal, is secured. So, in this way, I, I would say, in just exactly the same way, life will not start up in a universe uh, to which it really doesn't belong, in which it is, uh, can be regarded as nothing more than a stranger. So if you follow that out, you see this, that the whole existence of the universe depends on every individual. It isn't a question of how long you last, that the universe will only last as long as you do. That's not the point. The universe is much bigger than you are, and you are very small. But at this moment, it depends on you. The universe is much longer than you are, and you are very short in time. But nevertheless, it depends on you. The universe in the future, long after you are dead, 
will still be depending on the fact that you once existed. The universe in the past, existing long before you were ever thought of, still depends on the fact that one day you would exist, and it depends on each person. So, in other words, uh, there is, uh, in, in everything that happens, uh, every whole depends on every part. Because, you see, in truth, there are no parts of the universe. Parts are an abstract creation. When we think of someone or something as a part, we are quite arbitrarily cutting him off and saying, by convention, we will agree that our skins uh, are our boundary, and therefore, since our skins do not include the whole cosmos, we are only a part of it. But there are no parts. Just as in your own, when you study your own organism, all of it's continuous. All the so-called parts flow into the others, like the motions of waves. You not have detachable parts that you can unscrew inside you, you see? Unless you've got false teeth or something like that, then you can take it out, see? In the ordinary way, you can't unscrew parts of the human being from another. They're continuous. Well, in exactly the same way, you are continuous with this environment. And although we have been habituated to looking upon ourselves as separate things, we are no more separate from what's going on around us than each of these waves here are separate from the ocean or that Mount Tamalpais is separate from the planet Earth. We have great freedom of movement, so do the waves, so do the gulls floating in the air, so do the trees waving in the wind. We have a larger degree of freedom than that. Because we are more volatile. But we are just as much waves in the total process, it depending upon us, and we, in turn, depending upon it. Now understand, the meaning of there being no parts. All parts are ideas. We have an idea of a part. We chop things up and say one human being, two human beings, three human beings, and so on, and so think of it as parts. But that's not the way it works. You can see this from the most elementary neurology by understanding that uh, it is the way you are as a living body that evokes the kind of universe that you see. It is your body which turns the sun into light, which turns it into heat, which turns water into wet and rocks into hard. And in turn, your body is uh, one of the pulsations of nature along with the sun, the rocks, the water, etc. So there's a mutual arrangement. It creates you or evokes you, or does you, whatever word you want to use, and at the same moment, you do it, and you do all of it. So this is why uh, there was some kind of truth in astrology. I say this, but at the same time, I certainly don't consult astrologers and plot my life by mm -hmm. the crude calculations of hor horoscopy. Uh, but, uh, because you, you, if you do that, you, you get into endless tangles of self-deception, because it isn't accurate. But it has a principle. The astrologer was right. When he drew a map of your soul, he drew a crude map of the universe. He drew the universe as it was at the time and place of your birth. The universe, as it were, as seen from the point of view where you were born. And that was your soul. So your soul, you see, is not in your body. Your body is in your soul, because your soul is the entire network of relationships in terms of which you live. Your soul is the whole universe, but each one of us, as it were, is a different point in it. But all these points in it are the center. We can go way beyond Ptolemy and Copernicus now. And if we think that space is curved, every point of space is the center of the universe, because any point on a ball is the center of the sphere, of the surface. See? You can turn any point of a ball, and wherever you look at it, it's the center, isn't it? See? So in the same way, take a crystal ball in your hand, a crystal mirror. Uh, no, I'm, what I mean is not a crystal mirror, I mean a spherical mirror. Look at it. And wherever you turn it, your face will be in the middle. So in exactly the same way, every place in the universe is the middle of the universe, from a standpoint of curved space. 
So uh, we go back to uh, an entirely new uh, Ptolemaic view of the world. Beyond Copernicus. Not that the Earth is... The, yes, the Earth is the center of the universe. But every other place is also the center of the universe. There is no absolute center. I said that one of the aspects of cosmic gamesmanship that we were going to deal with would be group theory. And of course I don't mean exactly by that a sort of mathematical meaning. But the, the, the relationship uh, that's tremendously important and that is not sufficiently recognized between in-groups and out-groups where they're cold and they're all huddling together, the idea being to see who can get most inside. And uh, human beings are just like that. And so also is everything else. <laughs> because this is a, an absolutely basic requirement of having an identity. Lecture. And drawing a circle on the blackboard and asking the assembled multitudes what I have, what I have drawn. And people will almost invariably say that I have drawn a circle, a ring, or a ball. Only very rarely does some bright person suggest that I have drawn a wall with a hole in it. Because uh, the Gestalt theory of perception shows us that our attention is captured by enclosed areas as against open areas and by moving objects rather than still. And so always, therefore, we tend to prefer the in-situation. That is something, you see. Uh, the, the, the star is an in-situation with respect to space. The space is the out-situation. And so we feel that space is not important, it is nothing, it is uh, just unimportant in a way. But the in situation is something. So then whenever human beings get into an out situation, like being a rejected minority, living on the wrong side of the tracks, they will find reasons for convincing themselves that their situation is the truly in one and that the people who claim to be in are really out. So, as I have sometimes said before, I hope this uh, doesn't bore too many of you, but uh, in Sausalito we have exactly that situation. We have the hillbillies, who are the old-time people, who regard themselves as in, because they have the money and they live in the fancy houses up on the hill. And then we have the waterfront people, whom they regard as out as a, a nefarious bunch of beatniks and bohemians and scallywags. And so, so uh, the people of the hill top uh, fortify themselves at their cocktail parties with conversation about how awful the people are down on the waterfront. And at the cocktail parties down on the waterfront, uh, people fortify themselves by discussing the squares on the hill. And uh, we believe uh, down here that we have the true way of life, that uh, we're not beating our heads out, making money to buy pseudo-rocket ships. Although I do own a pseudo-rocket ship, but it was wished on me. <laughs> <laughs> because, you see, I try to be a bridge person. That's what's called a pontifex. One who, uh, <laughs> between opposed classes, points out the connections. Because the connection is that neither class would know who they were without the other. So it's tremendously necessary to have an out-group in order to know that you're an in-group. In other words, if you belong to the church, which is the assembly of the elect of God, or if you belong to the synagogue, which is to be a member of the chosen people, an outsider, all those goys, then uh, you know you're in. You see? But you must have the outsiders to know that you're in. There must, in other words, be beyond the pale of the village, the howling waste. And then you feel cozy, you feel protected, you feel you're there. And so in that way, bodies have skins, eggs have shells, 
and so on all through nature. Inside versus outside. But this versus must be understood as a form of symbiosis. And this is the crucial matter. This is absolutely of critical importance to anyone who wants to understand politics or military strategy or any of the real hard, tough games of life. That uh, social conflict or conflict between the various biological species is a form of symbiosis. Now, ordinarily, we consider the symbiotic relationship to be one of mutual support, as is obviously the case between bees and flowers. Which came the first, bee or flower? This is the same question as which came the first, egg or hen. Because where there are no flowers, there can't be bees. And where there are no bees or other fertilizing insects, there cannot be flowers. So the truth of the matter is that bees and flowers, different as they are in appearance, and separated as they may be in space, they constitute a single organism. This is the real lesson of the bees and the flowers. And uh, the same must be said truly of man and woman. There are no men without women. There are no women without men because it always takes a man and a woman to produce a human being. So we are a man-woman arrangement, a woman-man arrangement, whichever way you want to look at it. And so although, you see, therefore, we move and look as if we are individuals and separate from each other, this is not the case at all. So, now this, what I want to point out is that the same sort of relationship exists between groups that would seem to be hostile to each other. Now, what are some of the bases of hostility? The real basis of hostility is that the biological order is a mutual eating society. It's a very curious game indeed, and if you are philosophically inclined, it is one which might bother your conscience. When you realize that you as an organism are com a compound of murders, uh, you are actually a bag of water because the human organism consists mostly of water. And this water is held together and presented from slobbering, prevented from slobbering all over the floor by a very complex arabesque of tubes and cells and films, the material of which was invariably belonging to some other being before you got it. You had to kill a chicken, a cow, or a cabbage, or an apple in order to get that tensile film of tube or whatever to hold the water in you and as you. And so uh, we are, as human beings, a predatory creature. In fact, we are more predatory than anything else in nature. The sharks are supposed to be predatory, but they stay in the ocean. The piranha fish are supposed to be very predatory, but they stay in the Amazon. The eagles are predatory, but they stay in the air and on the land. Only man ranges the whole uh, range of elements, earth, air, and water, and preys on things, and he eats like a swarm of locusts. Not only does he prey on the living beings, he play, preys on the minerals. And uh, someone recently described our, our civilization as a lot of people sitting in the middle of a sewage dump shooting rockets at the moon. Because if you, you read, get Playboy magazine for um, September and read about the use of water, or rather the misuse of water in our civilization, and it is absolutely horrifying. We've got to get that atomic power bringing us water from the ocean in nothing flat, or we're going to be very thirsty. And you can see how uh, uh, we use water in the most amazingly uneconomical ways. So we are a predatory monster eating up the planet. And uh, I have seen, uh, say, a sorrel plant in the country covered with green flies. One day it is full of little green succulent bodies having a ball. 
A day or two later, stalk with grey dust all over it. So they've eaten up, they multiply to the point of eating up the plant, and so they turn into grey dust. Human beings could do just exactly the same thing. And the reason why human beings are in danger of this is that they have refused membership in a mutual eating society. They want to be top and only eater, and do not want to be eaten. So that instead nowadays of returning what you ate to the earth, we return our remains to the earth in an unassimilable form. Our remains include not only mummified, formaldehyded bodies, courtesy of the morticians, uh, encased in concrete so that no worms even can get in, but also the fact that many things that we return to the earth are no longer in the organic cycle. For example, rust does not assimilate properly. Uh, all sorts of chemicals, all sorts of gases that we give off do not return into the organic cycle. And we are ruining, uh, we, are, we are actually abolishing animals. Wild animals have less and less of a prospect of living. Wild birds are being greatly reduced in numbers. Whales have almost, are ceasing to exist because the whaling industry is getting rid of them. And what is more, some of the animals we farm, like chickens, are no longer chickens. They are strictly non-chickens which lay pseudo-eggs because they are raised in enormous wire cell blocks and fed on chemicals under the superstition that anything fed to a chicken will turn into chicken, and it won't. That is why you may have noticed that the chickens you buy don't taste like chickens could taste, especially those that have been allowed to run around in the sunlight and scratch. Those can become real chickens. Uh, because, you see, the, the necessary thing about any species that you live on is that you must love it. I love you so much I could eat you. Or, I eat you so much I could love you. But where you get things raised without love, you cannot love a whole cell block of chickens. You cannot love wheat when it is grown in vast wastelands or out of any trees and it is sheared off the earth and then uh, winnowed and uh, reduced to pancake makeup and then chemicals are added to it, and it is converted into the styrofoam material, called bread. <laughs> uh, you know, like one converts milk into casein, so one converts wheat or rye into a plastic material, which is a kind of universal solvent, which is nothing at all, and tastes of nothing at all. In fact, you know when you feed babies that kind of nasty white pablum, and you feed it and they always spit it back into the spoon? Well, our, our white bread reduces itself to that instantly on the contact with liquid and becomes a miserable paste. It's not bread at all. So, uh, if, if, if you are unwilling, you see, to join the Mutual Eating Society and you want to conquer everything and not be eaten by anything, the penalty you pay for this is uh, the annihilation of your species. And you eventually annihilate through eating things that taste like chalk and string. That's what it will come to. Because you don't love what you eat. You have no respect for the raw materials. So, uh, what we haven't understood then, is that all groups need an enemy group. But that the enemy group, which preys upon it, is actually a kind of friend. Because the enemy group prunes your own group. It keeps your population at a reasonable level, and it keeps you on your toes, because you have to defend yourself against it, so you don't become flabby. But you see, in uh, uh, we, we have lost the meaning of chivalry in all uh, war situations and all conflict situations. Chivalry is indicated, for example, still in such customs as that the partners to a fight salute each other before beginning to fight and salute each other again at the end. Uh, you shake hands before boxing. Uh, you um, do these various things. You bow before a judo contest and so on. And that means that you recognize the opponent as an honorable opponent, as somebody with whom uh, a fight is a really important matter. 
And that is uh, really one of the most essential laws of survival. To recognize that enemies, unless they are predatory locusts, who have no respect, who do not, in other words, farm the species that they prey upon. That's the essence of the thing. You must cherish the species you prey upon. You must see, like, for example, in, in lumbering, you must re-sow. You must plant a tree for every tree you take. That is cherishing the species. And if you farm cows, you don't uh, treat your cows, and you often treat them better than you would your servants. Because the servants can go hang, but the cows are valuable. And so you nurture them because they're going to sell as beef and they're going to provide milk or whatever it is. So the, the perception of the fact that it is absolutely necessary to have an outgroup for your having an ingroup and that you cannot do without it is the beginning of sociability.